two years, you'll replace a twenty-five dollar piece here next year. Hey, folks! It is time to get started. We're going to give everybody one more minute since the cookies are still had out there when when he came in. That seems to be more attractive than Roger and I, and I don't know why that is. But. Well, they must be getting down in cookies because because Rosen just walked in. So. Cookies are gone. That's why you're here. What's <laughs> that? You gonna do this? I'll, I'll go through to this, and you can do the draft update. Or okay, you can do it. All right, we're going to get going here. Welcome to uh, Ecrit. And welcome to Ecrit. We're going to get going. Uh, Mark just passed around the blue sheets. Please fill them out. Uh, we'd like to have a note taker. In fact, we have to have a note taker. And so I'm looking for a volunteer who would raise their hand and take the notes. And, and I, it's probably not fair to pick on the presenters to take the notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Roland, Roland, you'll take them. Thank you, Roland. Um, all right. You probably, I wonder, is Winterbottom coming in to be that or have we got going for that? Bernard's going to present there, right? Yeah, that was the plan. Backup plan was Bernard was going to present, though Bernard is not Bernard. here. Um, So the, uh, I'd like you to take a look at the note well on the on the screen there, and uh, know it and abide by it. Okay, so the, the agenda for today, uh, we've got two hours, so we probably won't need all that time. Uh, we've got uh, uh, four drafts to present. Uh, uh, routing request extension for the held protocol. James Winterbottom is um, supposed to present remotely, though uh, I'm not sure that that's going to happen. Uh, the backup plan was Bernard Aboba was going to present in his stead uh, in that case. So the next draft is uh, in vehicle emergency calls. Randy's going to present that. Then we have a pan European e call. And uh, Randy again, and then indoor location mechanisms uh, for emergency services, and Dorothy Stanley will present that. Uh, is there any bashing to be done of this agenda? Uh, yeah, that's that's the prompt. Are, are, is there bashing to be done to cover additional data? Additional data. Um, yeah, you. Uh, Brian Rosen, isn't it done? What What is there to do? Well, you had a working group last call. Yeah, there it's were been, no it's been there revved. Were, there it's been revved. There were some revs done. So we, do you want to provide Randy, a status? Randy, we think it's all done, right? I mean, we, we think we've addressed all the comments, right? Yeah. So we believe it's ready to go. Okay. So the Will reason I brought it, it up, because Randy submitted a presentation around it, so I didn't yeah, know if I, there was... I don't think we need to do it. I think we're ready to go. Unless okay. somebody objects, send it. All right. Good enough. Your time comes earlier. All right. Next slide, please. Oh, Christer. Uh, 
uh, I may have missed it, but I think at the previous and on the email discussions there were some. Uh, it we were going to add some text about, for example, if 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 you as additional data is sending media, and those kind of things that you could actually use the media plane for that. I'm not sure whether that was added or if it was. Then I apologize because I missed it. But I think that was the author was going to add some text about that. And, and so just a reminder, name, please. Uh, Randall Gallons. This is why I was going to suggest we do the slides for additional data just to address what the changes were that were made in the most recent rev, which do include additional clarifications. Um, it doesn't actually say to use media, but what it does is it says uh, that uh, sending data um, uh, by, you know, in band by, by value is not appropriate for large amounts of data. It actually, so there was clarifying text to that, which I believe was Christopher's point. So that's one of the three changes that were made in the recent rev. The other changes that I, I wanted to mention were mostly um, schema errors. And so that was the other thing about the slides is just to ask people, it's not too late. Um, if you would take a look at the draft, see if you find any errors in the schema, it's better to fix that now, that, that sort of I, thing. I guess I'm going to go back to the agenda bashing and object to, to not showing those slides. I, I'd I like to see the slides I if they clear up point, some confusion. At this point, we've, we're done because I've just said what I would have said with the slides. Okay. Well, one, six of one. All right. So then the uh, documents in the work group, the active ones are listed there. Um, Additional data, yeah, data only. Uh, we don't have a presentation for data only, but it has been uh, submitted to working group last call. Uh, okay. So, Randy, you're saying you'll send some comments about data only to the list? I, I, I thought we addressed them, but maybe not. For name, please. Brian Rosen, sorry. Uh, um, all right. If if we really haven't addressed them, we will address them. Right. I, I remember. I thought we did them. If we didn't, I apologize, and we will do them. So you can see uh, car crash e-call, similar location is up there. Held routing is up there, and then uh, so the comments were to be collected by 316 for that uh, data only, and we submitted to the ISG uh, additional data. It turns out we already submitted it once, but there was a glitch, so we resubmitted it by 3.8. And then there's nothing currently in the RFC editor's queue, though two RFCs were published since the last meeting, uh, 73.78, which was trustworthy. Yeah, great. And 74.06, which was unauthenticated. All right. Yeah, and then the last slide is the milestone list. Um, I don't think we, are there any uh, inputs about this list? Yeah, I was just noting that there's some aging drafts on that active list. So I think one of them was version 29, so I was, I was going to ask when we were expecting to see those pop out. Um, that's additional data, which right, which is that top one there. No, no, that's data only. Which where where'd that go? So oh, okay. So so that's that's coming along. So, so I additional I, data is yeah, second one additional data. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean milestone dates are always sort of fictive, but um, to Ben how he wants to manage this, I guess, but it seems like it wouldn't hurt to put some more realistic dates on these. Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay, the, the incoming AD request realistic dates. Okay. So, Roger and I talked about the third one there, the policy for redefining, and, and that's one of those drafts that seems to have lost momentum. And we're we, we did, we're going to invest. We're investigating that to see if there's enough interest even to to move it forward from this point. So the third one, policy for defining new service identifying labels. Yeah, and the other thing to mention is that if you do that 
check and find that there is not momentum to go forward, right. there's no shame in dropping the milestone. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, so Ben, are you our AD now, or is? Okay. So. Yes, if if you if you don't know, Alyssa's off taking care of a newborn. Cool. So that's it. In the agenda here. So well, the, the first presentation is James Winterbottom, which I, Bernard was supposed to be here to fill in for James, and that isn't happening. So I guess we go to the next one. didn't put these in order. You told me you should have done it. Which one's first? Car crash or this? Car crash. Okay. Oh, I wouldn't move that over here. Weren't where? You know, they only have to be there when the meeting starts, right? But it'd be nice if they were there. Never do today what I can put off and do tomorrow. So, I guess we don't even have a uh, mic on the table. But this oh, there is a mic on the table. This will be quick, okay. so I hope. Um, anyway, Randall Gallen. So this is the, the car crash draft. Uh, the, it's been revised yet again. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think people here are familiar with this draft. This draft um, describes how ITF mechanisms can be used for next generation vehicle automatic uh, crash notification, um, which is, uh, <coughs> this draft is focused on North America. Uh, so it does describe the models that are deployed currently and how those models can uh, migrate to next generation. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the, the, the purpose of the draft is to show how we use IETF mechanisms to transfer the data um, and how that data is recognized by PSAPs and how the calls are recognized as emergency uh, calls placed by vehicles with track data uh, so that they can be um, uh, processed as appropriate uh, by the PSAP. Uh, next slide. Uh, so anyway, this is um, uh, Six revisions since we had a big split a, few, a while back, Berlin, I think. Um, the main change in this revision, revision two, is that as suggested by Keith, um, this draft now uses the e-call draft as its basis. So it no longer specifies its own service URN, um, and it says it inherits all the technical aspects from the e-call draft. The primary difference then technically is that this draft specifies the use of the VEDS data structure, which is a data structure created by NINA and APCO, uh, rather than what the eCall draft does, which is the uh, MSP, eCall specific MSP. Uh, is that it? Okay. Keith Trage. So. There are still fundamental problems with this draft and the next draft going forward. As far as I understand, and that seems to be acknowledged by the authors on the list, they intend to use the cellular mobile radio system. If you use the term emergency call in the context of, emergency of cellular radio systems, then that means not the mechanism specified in this draft for making an emergency call, which uses lost and... Um, and um, so on, and then the drafts that are provided by IETF. So what you are making as far as the cell system is concerned at the moment on this draft is not an emergency call, and you need to clearly distinguish that state. Secondly, if you then include in the request an emergency call identifier that happens to be recognized by the system as an emergency call, it will turn it into an emergency call, which will not be handled correctly. Thirdly, um, 
well, no, there isn't a third on that one. But basically, you need to clearly distinguish what is this doing in regard to the cell, cell system. If it's using it as an ordinary call, or, or even just data over the top, then you need to clearly say so, and say it is not an emergency call as far as the cell system is concerned. If you are making it an emergency call as far as the cell system is concerned, it does not work because it, it, the cell system uses different mechanisms for making an emergency call to what is described in this draft. And also, even if you do try and make it work according to that, you've got to clearly say is what happens when you're roaming into a system that doesn't actually support this and is the expectation that you only have a voice call in that respect as a result of that. And you've also got to say what happens when service continuity happens. Uh, Randall Gallens, OC. Um, I remember all the points. So uh, first off, this draft, I don't believe, specifies anything about how to do call setup that is at all. It, it does refer to them, but I don't believe that that makes this incompatible with uh, placing a call over the cellular network because we made sure that those base drafts are uh, compatible with the 3GPP way of placing emergency calls. For example, in those drafts, uh, it specifically permits the way that emergency calls are placed over a cell network, which is that the client, the UE, does not use loss, but rather the UE just places the emergency the, the base, okay, these documents don't talk about lost at all. They do refer to the base documents. Car crash doesn't, car crash talks about lost? Uh, not in the context of the UE using lost at all. No, 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 that, it, it, there's an informal aside about, about how lost will turn uh, service URNs that are subchildren of SOS into SOS. So these documents don't say that the UE uses lost. The yes. base documents that they refer to permit the 3GPP way of, of placing an emergency call, which is to, um, to uh, simply place the call through the voice proxy, which in this case will be the, uh, the cell network. So uh, that was the first one. Um, Right. So I, I don't believe that these documents, I believe that uh, uh, you write that there are issues, those issues are out of scope of these documents. Those, those deal with certain switch and so forth, which are completely out of scope. Claim a place in the queue sure. with this mic. Right. So you are basically saying you expect this to happen as an emergency call on the 3GPP system, right. if 3GPP happens to be the network, right. right. So that first of all needs to be established, um, and therefore you need to remove the references to the ACREE documents that talk about setting up emergency calls according to the IATF mechanism, because I believe those are in there, and that's where you start going into lost and so on. Those documents are referenced, but like I said, those documents mm. Well, they're in conflict with the 3GPP system of making an emergency call. I, I don't believe that's true. I believe that those documents, they do say that the normal way is that the UE uses loss and blah, 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 but they do explicitly permit the 3GPP way, which well, is where the UE just places the call. Well, all I would say is if you end up with using lost, it will return presumably a telephone number which will not be recognized by the 3GPP system as UE as an emergency call, and therefore it will not be made as an emergency call. And you will not get an emergency bearer, and you will not go to the local PCSCF. Yeah, but that's basically the problem you've got with those references, which I believe are still there. But anyway, let's go back to, right, we are now making this as... I just wanted to clarify one thing. Even if lost is used, which it won't be, but even if it were used, it's not going to return a phone number. It would return the SOS URL. I don't know, would it? I think that's the intent. Mm. I mean, my understanding of Lost was that basically you used the SOS URL to actually get a phone number back. But well, it gives you a SIP mm. or a SIP URL or, or something. Or yeah, yeah it but it's not, an, it's not an SOS URL oh, that okay. comes back. But, but it, the point is, though, that the UE, in this case the vehicle, is not going to be using 
lost, and the UP is going to be sending an emergency call to the consumer. Brian Rosen. So if you were in a place that wanted the 3TPP mechanism to be the way that it was done, then you could clearly put a lost service boundary in that said, within this service boundary, the return URI is urine service SOS, meaning forward the call to your proxy with urine service SOS, and the lost server would be happy to do that, and the call processor would just do that and pass it on to whatever the next step in its normal call path would be with the urine remaining and the request URI, and it would actually be in the header is what would happen if we route that. Weird, but it would work. But there's nothing in this draft that says that the UE or the vehicle is going to be using lost, and the base drafts that this document does refer to do explicitly permit the client to send the call to a proxy rather than to the call, which is a 3TPP mechanism. So were there other things on this? Yeah, so if it does end up using the 3TPP system and making a 3TPP emergency call, then in many countries this is not going to be, the SOS URN will be stripped and it will end up being an SOS call, i.e. a standard emergency call. Now, I don't believe you actually cover that scenario, but it needs to actually clearly state if that's what's going to happen, that it's acceptable that that is what you end up with. So let me just clarify. The documents do talk about that, actually. The SOS, the children of the SOS URN, the request URN on it is not actually stripped. What happens is the call is delivered to the person, and it gets treated exactly the same for routing purposes as a normal, just as if you only said SOS, but the data is not lost, it's not stripped, so that downstream elements, such as, for example, if you're doing this with an arrow, or if you're doing this with an ESI net, the ESI net can take into account the fact that this is, that the children in the area are not stripped, but that information is ignored outside of the emergency service area. Yeah, but the end result of that is you still could end up with a piece out that doesn't actually support this extension, and therefore it is expecting to see an ordinary voice call, and that is the end result of the scenario for that. But there's also the parallel scenario where the, in fact, the emergency call is not yet supported by many operators in IMS. So if it receives an emergency call request at the PCSCF, it redirects that to the CS network, and that redirection will be done on the basis of it being a standard emergency call, not one with subtypes. And so in the CS domain, it will be told to make a standard emergency call, which will be a voice call of some form. That's absolutely right. So you could easily have a situation, in fact, there's a broadcast slide, so that the UE will probably never be replaced. Yeah, so what I'm getting to is if you expect those to happen, which are described by the 3GPP system at the moment, then you need to actually accept in the document that those are actually going to happen and give some hint that that's what's going to happen. So there isn't this expectation that you're always going to end up with the data getting through. Well, the documents do talk about cases where the data does not get through, but the point is that any time that you are falling back, that's the problem. Yeah, well, I don't know. Sorry, frankly, when you drive and you move in a room, if you're either not placing a call on IMS, you're only out of the IMS, out of a region in which IMS emergency calls are supported, in all of those scenarios, you end up in such a domain, which is out of the scope of the IMS, which is out of the scope of the IMS, which is out of the scope of the IMS, which is out of the scope of the IMS, which is out of the scope of the IMS. Furthermore, if this call doesn't end up in the system that does not support this, you end up with an ordinary voice call. The data is used. But that's the point I'm making. Basically, you end up needing to describe that as being the end result and that the data will not get through in certain scenarios, if that's what you expect to happen. Yes, so in fact, the e-call document does talk about that, which this document inherits. So it does, in fact, say that the call could end up at a piece that does not support 
the data and in which case you don't get the acknowledgement of the data and hence the vehicle knows that it needs to fall back. And in North America, there are fallback mechanisms that are covered in the uh, car crash document, the car crash car crash. So the car crash document does also talk about that. Um, the circuit switch scenarios that are deployed now um, pass some amount of data, possibly only the location of the data, verbally, uh, either through a, a unit and a call center or through a text of speech um, aspect of the car. It does talk about how the vehicle can detect that the data was not received by the PSAP and therefore it will fall back to the The one thing that we lost when we um, made eCall, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, crash reference eCall, which wasn't really covered in the original call thing, but was in the, in the original document that I wrote, is the possibility of a VEDS transfer without a voice call, like a data only, right? The tech, there is no way at this point to mention data only because there is no such thing in eCall, and by referencing the eCall document as the call setup thing, we, we lost that, and I'd like to get that back somewhere. Uh, a scenario where the vehicle deliberately does not want to set up. Yeah, the there is no voice back to somebody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, normally in emergency calling the voice is a requirement, and that is secondary, so you usually always want to Well. Okay, there, I mean, there's a case where you're using it off-label, and it's not, you're not placing the reference to the PSAP, you're placing it to the call center where you might have the data. There, there, there are scenarios in which there is no voice path, and only data is available. It could be bandwidth constraints, it could be, it could be there is no person available to talk to, they are unconscious or whatever, and there is no voice path. So I, in that case, I'd like to be able, I'd like the standards to cover the possibility of data only with additional data. Well, if, if you're talking about the case where the vehicle occupants are unconscious, you still want to operate it on here. But in general, you, you, you don't you want that. I, 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 so I'm happy to put some text in, but um, I'm having a little trouble coming up with what the justification is. Aside from the off-label use, we're not really trying to talk to the PSAP. Do you want to send me an email? I Right, so you can't do that if it, as a 3GPP emergency call. Fundamentally, you break the stage one in 22101 if you do not have a voice path. If you have an emergency call on IMS, or on CS domain, come to that, there must be a voice path, and if you want an option that excludes that, it must not be a 3GPP emergency call. I, I, I prefaced the whole discussion by saying the problem with doing a reference to eCall was we lost this because I know that the eCall thing does not have a possibility of a data-only call. I know that. Yeah, but I'm saying even in any usage of the 3GPP network as an emergency call, you shall not have the possibility of doing that either. Um, Unless you actually take it through the 3GPP standards and make it a legitimate option. And it's not at the moment. Right, because there is no notion of, for example, a text emergency call. There is a notion of a text emergency call, but it's accompanying a voice bearer. Every multimedia emergency call right. has a voice it's bearer. It's only emergency yeah. calls. Yeah. Right. Okay, so car crash. I think we're done, right, Randy? So we just had... Randy, do you want to draw a conclusion for the note taker on what, you're, what you need to do? So, because you're the one that's going to have to act on the notes, right? Uh, let's see. So... Uh, the, the action item is that uh, Brian was requesting an ability to do uh, a call without a voice path in car crash, and he's going to send me some email to suggest the, the setup scenario and justification, and then we can see how to fit that into the draft. Um, Keith had a number of points about uh, the fact that this draft does rely on 3GPP, but, and I apologize if I'm misunderstanding, but I not aware that there's any changes needed to the draft uh, because I believe all of the things that you're talking about are covered already. Uh, 
But, but Randy, you will review the draft to make sure oh, yeah. that all his points are fair. Sure. Okay. So, so as a housekeeping, uh, Bernard, we're going to put you on the spot. You're you're going to present for James. We've already gone. I was hoping to have James present for himself using your computer. So you're going to wake him up? But you want you want him on the you don't want him on the projector. He'll be on the projector if you go into Chrome. He'll be there. He's already waiting in the. Yeah, it's just a URI. It has to be Chrome though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to look. Uh, this is through for portal, so had some graphics issues with. But we can try it. Yeah, try it out. I do not have Chrome. HTTPS. Pull up slash slash. J I T S I. Down tools. ITF.org slash secret E C R I T. Yeah. So from an agenda perspective, we skipped James. Now we're going in with on with Randy's first one. Now we're going back to James, and then we'll come back to Randy's second one. And then we'll we should see James. Shortly. He's that short? Well, he'll be shorter in here than he is in real life. Okay. And, um, so you need this. Here he is. Well, but you want the slides. Let's, you'll get the slides because he can do screen okay. sharing. Okay. And we will plug him in. James, can you hear us? We cannot, you got to do the sharing thing, the sharing icon. We can see you. We can see you. Actually, uh, put the mic near your PC. Yeah. We don't have to wait. Yeah, it's, uh, you can move your mouse up a little bit. Yeah, see, there's a screen sharing icon. And if you click on it, you can select a window to share. Do I click this? Click that, and it should show. It's still coming in, but it should show up soon. Yes, no. It seems like we've lost his. Uh, well, you lose his video, but you should. Uh, oh, I see. Get his sharing stuff. Um, well, how about this? Uh, if this doesn't come up in a couple of seconds, we can just go show his slides on the screen, and you'll hear his voice, so he can talk to it anyway, and we'll just turn the slides. So how about that? James? Uh, we, we can't see your share, but what we're going to do is bring up the slides I'll on the screen. I'll bring up the slides. And uh, attach, well, no, no, yeah, have your voice come in and we'll show them, okay? Just tell us when you're turning the slides. When we okay. need to turn the slides, later. Yeah, when we need to turn. Right. Um, that's much better now that I've turned off the screen as well. <laughs> so, uh, help, help, um, bring an extension. Uh, bring it. Okay, are you there? Yep, we're here. 
Hey James, can can you make your your voice as loud as possible? Is, uh, is mic loud enough? Wow, that's about as loud as I can make it without actually. Using Where's your speaker, Dino? Uh, no, I don't know. It sounds like it's under. Is it? Okay, try it again, James. Um, that's about as loud as I can make it without no, disturbing the neighbors. Good, we're ready to go. Okay, all right. So. Um, this is held reading. This is the best revision since it, it went into uh, into, into ECRIT as a working group item. Um, if we go to slide two, this is the, the picture of the environment that we're talking about. That was it really came about for part of the M four nine three work that Etsy was doing, um, which had to comply with the work item that had been put into Etsy, which is why we couldn't pick up and use um, the the vanilla um, IETF solutions. Um, in this case, basically, the the the, uh, the VSP performs a, a location request to to an access network, and as part of that, it will get back a location URI and an e essentially an ECRF emergency call um, routing function uh, uh, URI, uh, which it can then pass all the way through the system. So we really needed to be able to get the the routing information in the same. Um, request as, as the uh, location request uh, because we didn't actually have access to, to the location information itself. Um, so changes since last time, um, there were two useful sets of comments that were provided. In fact, they were the only comments that were provided to the list. Uh, one was from Randy, which he basically wanted to include uh, an optional service tag that you could pass through. Uh, and if you didn't pass that through, then you just got URN service SOS. And the response was uh, essentially the the um, URI that that would route to, rather than getting them all for police, fire, and ambulance independently. So if you want police, you can ask for police, and if you don't get it, it'll default back to SOS. So that was added into the schema and into the text. Um, Roger provided quite a few comments. Some of them were editorial, which I've largely adopted into the document, uh, and some of them were really comments around the architecture, which didn't really fit well into the ES203178 um, uh, specifications. So I haven't actually specifically covered those in the document. Um, I have indicated in places why we didn't pick up and use LOST um, in, in its vanilla form for, for certain objects, particularly the mapping object. Uh, and that is covered in, in the document as to why we haven't done that. Um, so the next piece is basically just the two examples. So I'm on slide four at this point. Um, which shows the example of the request where you've included the routing request in the in the, um, in, in the in the location request, and then on slide five you have the uh, the response for that where it's defaulted back to the URN service SOS for the for the uh, service tag in the response, um, and that's really that the only things that have changed in this draft since the version one. Anybody have questions for James? Uh, James, um, the examples that you've given and everything else, the only thing you show in the response is the URN, but can you send all the normal lost response? Um, so the question is, um, what, why do we need all of the standard lost response? Um, there's a lot in that which makes assumptions that you're caching information, etc., which uh, the draft explicitly says, do not do this. Um, where the information came from, I've, I've covered that explicitly in the draft in that that required, it, it, the way LOST is currently written for, for that information, it needs to point back to an authoritative server, an authoritative LOST server, which we don't have in this case. So uh, if you can explicitly say which information you want added, I can, I can, we can take that back into Etsy and see if that's something that we want to do. But currently, the, the information that we've got in there is sufficient to meet our purposes. Um, I'm concerned that um, doing a, a, a solving the needs of one constituency is the wrong approach for an ITF document. Um, I'll give you the example that in the US, we're now thinking about having returning civic addresses for mobile phones in order to get a high quality location for dispatch. Um, and that might end up getting used at some point, not in currently in, under discussion for routing. Um, 
and in that case, a service boundary of, say, the entire city might be really interesting to have if you have a mobile device. I, I, would, I would not like to see an ITF document that lost information currently returned from the lost server, sorry for the double use of the but, word. But we already have to have that. I, I've already spelled I, out there, why, I think why there is no add some of that information because the current lost specification requires it to point back to a lost server. If you don't have a lost server, you can't do that. So I, I, again, uh, returning civic information it isn't allowed in this specification because the VSP is entrusted to that degree. And so it's unclear to me what information you think you think is explicitly being lost that I can include into this specification. So caching isn't an issue. So the mapping boundary, or the mapping time doesn't apply. And the uh, I don't have an authoritative server URI that I can go to to check the stuff that's being provided. So uh, perhaps you could put to the list explicitly what information you think in addition to this. I, I, I can certainly send to the list what I think should be there. I point out, I mean, first of all, let me repeat what I said. I don't think an IETF document should limit itself to a single use case, especially when you can see uses beyond it. I do think that you could supply information in an optional manner, right? You can say, define the mechanism so that additional data can be returned. It certainly could be a local policy of, a, of the um, of the list, I guess, is what we're talking about uh, okay, here. Okay, but, but the URI, the, the, the XML in this case, Brian, has explicit extension points in it. There would be absolutely nothing to stop somebody from coming along and writing an adaptive draft that would include additional data to be responded there. In addition to that, uh, you know, you could you can still return a PDF which would have that, that information in it if you want. So I don't think there's anything here that precludes you from adding that information if you want. And, and, and indeed, when I've defined the, the XML specifically for the, um, the routing information here, you can add whatever you want to that. Um, perhaps what we should be looking at is whether or not the, and I can't remember off the top of my head, whether or not the, um, the service piece itself has an extension point in it to add additional information at the bottom of the service. Um, that wouldn't be very difficult to add if it's not there already. Um, I can probably check that even now whilst we're talking. Um, so that, that sounds to me like James, that would address uh, your, honest, your requirement, right? James, uh, James, this is uh, So I think, I think we should definitely check whether there's, uh, how the extension points are set to make sure that uh, we can actually then extend uh, the mechanism later on or pass additional information around. And I think we should also um, uh, look into uh, what Brian uh, suggested, to look at the items and see what the implications are of returning those that we have in lost and as you, as you just... Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't really hear you too well, Hannes. It's kind of breaking up a bit. Um, okay. I have just checked the service um, uh, type in the URI, it, sorry, in the XML, and, and there isn't currently an extension point at the bottom of, um, at the, bottom of the uh, restriction. So I, I can add an extension point into the bottom of the sequence there so that you could add underneath destination, you could add a, additional... Um, types if that's what you wanted to do. Uh, that would be very easy to do and I think that that would address most of what Brian's just said so that somebody could come along in a future draft and, and expand on where they want to put stuff. Right. Would that meet your requirement, Brian? I, I would prefer for the ITF document at the outset to be able to return everything that loss does. If a particular implementation did not return that data, no problem. The loss server is not required to return that data. So it's all considered optional no, but, in the data. But you're not, you're not right. So Some rather of the than loss data is required. And that's why I didn't just pick up and use the mapping element. Otherwise, I would have used it. Right? But I can't, I can't do that. I'm sorry. You, you talked over me, and I couldn't hear what you, why, why you can't yeah. do it. It, it explains in the draft why you can't do that for certain elements, right? It, and they're mandatory currently. If, if the information makes no sense, then you don't return it. If it does make sense and, and the local policy of the server is to return it, return it. The ITF document and the schema should allow it. Um, I, I still think that 
you could, if, if you want to extend this in order to support that, that's fine. But I don't think we need to start with that information in, in, the, in the context of the way in which this draft is being applied. I think it adds complexity for, for, for no real benefit because you're making an assumption that the information is coming from a lost service and it may not be. And indeed, the, the, the most common use case for this, as is described in the draft, is that it isn't. So, go ahead, Brian, if you got another comment. I, I, I would like to, I mean, maybe we ought to do this on the list. So, it's perhaps premature to have this discussion, but I, I, I object to restricting this device, this document, to a single use case. It's a mechanism that has been decided that we would go ahead and do just fine. It should be able to return, be able to return everything that's in a lost response. If you don't have a lost thing, then you wouldn't have the data to return. If you don't want to send it, don't send it. But don't restrict the document when it comes out as an ITF document to a single use case. Brian, uh, the issue, it, it makes sense to us to um, single use case or multiple use case. What you are essentially saying is return information, although I have no use case uh, for that, and return it nevertheless anyway. Uh, why not stuff pictures in there? Uh, we don't know the use case for that either, but it would, wouldn't it be nice uh, to send pictures around? Or videos? You know, like that's roughly the level of argument you provide. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think that the, um, the generic problem that we're solving is instead of requiring two device, two independent issue, uh, two independent functions, the route server and the location server, and require the device to query them sequentially as the current ITF draft offers, we, we have an option to have it done in a single operation where it is possible that the um, location server knows the route by some method other than a lost server, fine, but it might, it, it would work, the same mechanism would work if it did have a lost server. And since we are, we are explicitly trying to modify our architecture to accommodate environments in which it is desirable to not have two independent queries by the endpoint and to make that at, as, as general as possible so that other en entities could use the same idea. I think that's a reasonable request. I can write text if that would be helpful. I think there are other people who would agree, but maybe we should have this discussion on the list for a while, techni the technical discussion. <coughs> Randall Gallons, I, actually I would like to see what changes you'd propose to make to the document because I think it would help understand what we're, what we're talking about. So the conclusion to that discussion is Brian's going to send text to the list. Is that the last, <coughs> last slide then? Yeah. Cool. So James, do you have any other comments on that? Um, not, not really, no. Um, I'll, I'll await Brian's text. I, I still think that the, the easiest approach would be to put a, um, an extension point at the end of the service element so that um, things that need to extend that in order to put that additional information in can rather than putting it into the base specification. But I'll wait to see what Brian sends to the list and what the general list response is because this is a working group document. It's not my personal document. Right. So. We'll do that. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. All right. Thanks, everybody. Sorry about the delay. It's okay. So next up is eCall, I believe. Mm -hmm. I just got to figure out where I have it. Okay, uh, Randall Gellens. Uh, this is the eCall revision. Uh, this document is similar to the car crash document, but the, the, this is the base for that one. This one does um, 
is focused on, whereas the car crash is focused on uh, North America in specific, but also uh, next generation um, automatic advanced vehicle no, uh, crash notification in general, this document is more specific about the pan European e-call service uh, and how that service exchange data over uh, the SIP signaling. So next uh, slide, uh, right, the uh, regulations. And one thing to, to note is that uh, the Etsy did a report on e-call migration uh, recommendations for um, moving e-call to VoIP services, which does, in fact, um, re reference this document and recommend going forward with that one. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so there's been some fairly minor stuff in here, some clarifications mostly. Okay, I think that's it. So, is there any more discussion? What, what, what do we need to do to this? Um, I, at this point, um, I think we're moving forward. Keith wants his personal microphone back. So I'm going to think we start from essentially on. Yeah. We start from much the same problems as we got with the previous document, and that basically this is assuming the use of the 3GPP IMS, or seems to be, but un underlying that, 3GPP hasn't actually addressed the issues that might be associated with this. So basically, you're saying it's going to end up being a standard emergency call through IMS, in the vague hope that the piece that handles it as an e-call. And therefore, you've got everything that 3GPP does with a normal call going to happen to this at the end of the day. Okay. Um, I think the assumption is that this the call will be set up. Uh, I believe the assumption is that the call will be set up as an as an IMS emergency call. Uh, obviously, only in an environment where IMS emergency calls. Chris Terholma, I, it's probably too early to go into technical discussions, but I mean, this is also similar. I mean, I heard comments that, uh, for example, the reason we want to use SIP signaling here is because we do that in, in, in additional data. But I mean, I, I think that's not justification enough. I mean, the, the picture is much bigger here, and there are things that uh, Keith mentioned earlier about service continuity and so on, and we can see it, whether it's it's none of our business, but I mean, I, I think the, the, the ID should have a solution which uh, uh, 3GPP can eventually adopt. I mean, we can move forward with this, and then 3GPP finds out oh, they can't use it, and, and then, you know, we need to do something else, which is going to confuse everyone. Um, so similar to this, maybe, you know, again, uh, for additional data, we, we agreed, and I... And, as was mentioned, that has been put text into the draft that you can, for example, use the media plane or in band if you have large data and so on and so on. Uh, I guess that would apply to this also. Uh, but I'm not really suggesting here to, to change something because, again, we, uh, I think you need, we need to get some more requirements from, from, from 3DPP regarding this. I know that there has been added in this draft, in the latest version, there are some 3DPP requirements, but those, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, are for circuit switched uh, e-call, so that's I don't think they belong in this draft to begin with. But uh, so so and so. Actually, the the e-call requirements uh, were in this draft from the beginning. The, yeah, they weren't added recently. What was added recently? There were some clarifications about not about the data not being appropriate for large. The, the mechanism not being appropriate for large amounts of data. So while this document is very specific about using the MSD, it does say that should something other than the MSD that's larger be defined in the future, um, at that time it'll need someone, whoever's de deciding to use this other block of data will need to carefully decide whether this mechanism is still appropriate for that. So it does say that to address your concerns.
Well, when, when you say the size of MSD, I mean, first is, of course, the size of a block, but I mean, also size is when the, the frequency of, of MSD is sent. I mean, how much or how many those you send. I mean, uh, that's also going to have a, I mean, you don't want to overload, for example, your SIP servers. I mean, this is information, if you send it in, in SIP, they, they are going to traverse all these proxies and, and they need to handle it and, and so on and so on. And, and if you have a big accident, for example, you, there's potentially there's going to be a lot of tra traffic from, from a single specific location. So that's what I'm saying. Those, are, those kind of things need to be taken in consideration before we just say, you know, send everything on SIP because it, it may not be the most appropriate mechanism. So Keith Drage. Well, first of all, in our summary of 22.101 requirements, I think it's missing the one that says eCall is supported using TS-22, um, which is a circuit switch concept. Um, I mean, basically, the problem you're going to hit is that basically you're assuming that you're going to end up with 3GPP IMS treating this as an ordinary emergency call. Because that's all that, that it, that's all that, that's all that 3GPP define at the moment. If at some point in the future 3GPP defines an e-call based on IMS, it could well end up being incompatible with this draft. Because it's within the scope of 3GPP to do that. It's their job. Not to make it in, to necessarily to try and make it incompatible, but if they think they've got requirements to take it in a certain direction, they've got to take it in that direction, independent of what IETF might be trying to do in terms of their draft. Roland Gieske, Deutsche Telekom, as, as an operator which we have already implemented eCall for, let's say, circuit switched uh, devices. Uh, the problem is also the industry for automobile has already deployed all the SIMs and stuff. So with regard to that, of course, we need something in future with regard to your graph, which I describing everything very clear. But we need also the, the compatible way described and also that what goes in line with the GPT, the voltage stuff and, and IMS stuff, because that, that's what, what we are rolling out everywhere in the world and deploying it. And, and it, it's a little bit tricky now to have an idea graph which proceeds and we have something and, and people are pointing to that. Uh, also, we, we, we send a sign for industry to what we are doing now. Do we have to deploy further the eco stuff? We have already rolling out, starting rolling out, they have started. And, and that's, that's a little bit also uh, politics what we have. And that's why I would like also to wait with that stuff. May, may I ask a question? So your concern is that we do this work and it could potentially, it is IP based and it could potentially uh, lead to the impression that uh, the circuit switch stuff could actually be at, at some point in time replaced by IP. Yeah. You, know what the, you know what the initial motivation for doing that work was? Vodafone came to us and said we have we, we are working on a circuit switch, but we actually are going to switch over to IP uh, in the future, and so we need to have a solution not for circuit switch, but for IP. It's funny. At least Vodafone is a free Roland uh, Vodafone is a free GPP member, and the thing is uh, rolling out that all that stuff, the cars will work for 10, 15, 20 years, and we have to provide that this will work for this 10, 15, and 20 years. And, and we have also to provide that the IP solution must be compatible both that we can provide something that, that is workable. Actually, solution-wise, we actually tried the best to make it compatible. Um, so I think the secret there is to uh, use the semantics of this MSD. However, what is different that I hear Krista saying is uh, he, he, or uh, if I paraphrase you, you're saying, um, you're phrasing it with this big data and you m made up the story that mass accident and so like uh, you sent multiple MSDs, uh, maybe maybe hundreds uh, even, not a piece, it's a piece of cake for networks, but, but still uh, um, we added some text on 
when we were understanding you as sending big data in a sense of sending video. Uh, that's what we were what you were talking about. That uh, too. That too. Yeah, we're and also talking about frequency. Like yeah. Frequency. Uh, and and we are and that's what we added to address that comment uh, because we never anticipated that uh, someone would would, would put a video into the MSD. Uh, that's not what we we meant. Um, I think I think the, the sending being worried about uh, messages being sent in in, in the MSD or MSD messages sent frequently in a in a mass accident. I, I think it's a it's um, I, I I want to see the data, but I think underlying to that is I hear you say that um, you apparently have some company position to have the same solution uh, in band solution. Uh, Today, the e-call solution, circuit switch e-call solution is an in-band solution. You basically use a, a, a voice modem to decode these type of things, and you want to sort of have a similar solution. Is that, is that sort of, or, or are you, do you have, are you aware of any patterns in that environment? Uh, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to reply to a few of the comments. Um, so uh, it's not the case that this document came out of thin air. Uh, this document is done, I think, with understanding of how e-call works and how what makes sense for e-call migration. Um, and if, if you go back, I think um, it, there's a specific reference to the Etsy draft that has recommendations. Yeah, there we go. So if you go and read this particular Etsy draft, it does say this is how we believe, Etsy believes, that e-call should work over IP. And it does, in fact, reference this draft. So we're not doing anything in this draft that's at all um, contradictory. However, obviously, um, as uh, Keith was saying, 3GPP uh, uh, will be defining their own requirements. Um, I wouldn't want this draft to be published as an RFC next week because that wouldn't give 3GPP time. But that's not going to happen. This draft is still in the working group. It hasn't even gone to working group last call yet. So um, 3GPP, as we know, is working on this. Um, so I don't see any kind of uh, conflict there whatsoever. Um, and I'm sorry, um, uh, your name? I apologize. Roland. Roland, I apologize. So you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, that you wanted you you were concerned that this draft could be confusing implementers about whether they should be halting deployment of circuit switch and and waiting for this. Um, and I wanted to say that's absolutely not anybody's intent whatsoever. But you also mentioned that vehicles are, gonna, are on the road for 10 to 15 years, which is absolutely true. It's also true that vehicle manufacturers and their, interest and their vendors need several years lead time in order to have everything in place. So given the time frame that um, IMS networks are being deployed, IMS emergency services are being deployed. We do need an IMS-based mechanism uh, to be standardized. There's not any intent that the circuit switch mechanism be uh, halted or delayed in any way whatsoever. But in order to provide clarity to the vehicle manufacturers and the telecom providers and the PSAPs and so forth, we need a clear specification for how things will work in IMS. And then, as you say, of course, there's going to be a very important issue of how things work in migration. Um, and during that, uh, that sort of migration era, when, when you may have uh, IMS deployment be spotty or something like that, and that's a subject of 3GPP. There is some talk about it in that draft, but I expect 3GPP will have a, a much more. Okay, Keith, again. Sorry, a number of points. First of all, you've mentioned you tried to make it look like CS domain equal as much as possible, and that's good. Yeah. And yeah, fine, you can do that now. You've um, mentioned that you want to make it work in accordance with at least IMS normal emergency call, and yes, you can do that now. What you can't cater for is what extra requirements 3GPP has to address to on top. And I'll give an example. One example is that basically you are assuming that everything is either all PSAPs handled um, an IMS version, and all cars handle the IMS version, or the existing scenario applies where all PSAP handle the CS domain version, and all cars handle the CS domain version. But when you start mixing those together, you're probably going to end up with either requirements that someone has to support both of them, 
or someone's going to do some interworking in the middle. And we don't know how that's going to actually, that discussion, which has to happen at some point in 3GPP, is going to resolve, or what constraints that might then introduce on how eCall works. So, so there are fundamental issues that 3GPP need to discuss, and that brings me to my second point, is that discussion has not yet started in 3GPP. 3GPP is the standard organisation that have got to write this, not Etsy. That TR has been sent to Etsy, but no working group in 3GPP has yet given it technical discussion. So it's a set of proposals only that 3GPP might consider, not anything that 3GPP has endorsed. Now I would love someone to come into 3GPP at stage one with a work item saying, do we call an IMS? But I don't think it's my part as a vendor to do that. I think the operator should be bringing that in. We would support it, but no one has done that in SA1 yet. So, um, I, I don't, this document is not saying anywhere that uh, the whole world is circuit switched or the whole world is IMS. This document is saying when you have IMS, this is how IMS e calls are placed. The bigger picture of how the migration happens, uh, for example, you know, one, one very likely outcome is that vehicles will have dual mode and will support both circuit switch and IMS and there'll be an indication in the network, just as there's an indication now as to whether an emergency call should be placed in the circuit switch domain or in the IMS domain, there could be an indication that an e-call should be placed in the circuit switch domain or the IMS domain. Um, however, if that's not the scope of this document, it is the scope of 3GPP. Um, if the Etsy document um, has not yet been endorsed by 3GPP, but you know, in reality, the, the people participating in that Many of them are also participating in 3GPP. Um, I think we all know that work, a work item in 3GPP is coming. It's just a matter of um, you know, when exactly it's going to show up and who's going to be the, uh, the primary driver. Yeah, Roland. Uh, as for the Etsy document, as you can see, it's a TR. TR is a technical report, and that was put together to, let's say, discover what possibilities uh, are there to deploy the e-call and, and that was done by, by a specific uh, work group. Uh, yeah, Van Albaki was, was already here, that was in Berlin as I can remember and, and we had some discussions about the URNs and, and such kind of stuff and it was, it was, or it was a moving document and, and it was taking the stuff what's, what's already here with regard to your draft and, and so on and so on. This TR will be of course taken, I think, by SA1 to look into, but it's not a Bible. So, right. so it is only to show what is possible, right. and it will not be the final solution. That I'm I, I would only clarify that it's a little bit more than simply showing what's possible. It does actually make recommendations as well. Uh, of course, it's up to 3 GPP to accept those recommendations or not, but we're not talking about sending this for IETF last call yet, so we have time. Yeah, uh, my name is Georg Meyer. I'm um, with Huawei, but also the uh, new uh, 3GPP CT plenary chair and therefore the uh, liaison person towards IT here. Um, I, I agree with what I've heard from basically from Keys and from um, Roland. We need to be at least careful that this doesn't give the impression to 3GPP that work is done based on this TR already here in IETF and basically uh, things are written in stone, um, which then pushes uh, 3GPP into certain directions which might not be in line with what's coming out of SA1 or whatever the requirements are further handled, uh, maybe in SA2 or whatever. So what, what I hear is, yes, okay, it's, it's not going for working group last call yet, I understand that, but I think the we should give a very clear indication somewhere, either in the draft or I don't know, maybe by a liaison, saying uh, that this is currently work in progress and um, it, it's not the intention that we in the end have two solutions that sort of compete with each other. Thank you. So Randy, just a kind of administrative, has, has the motivation for this draft changed or 
do you think it's different now than you know the original? I don't. I don't believe so. I mean, I think that uh, my understanding is that there's um, there's a growing sense among interested people, in many, you know, including many people within who are very active in GPP, many companies, that uh, we do need an IMS solution to be specified for the reasons that we say that vehicles will last for 10 or 15 years. Operators are deploying IMS networks. IMS emergency calls are coming. Um, we really don't want it to go around for a few more years. We need a specification for how these calls can to work. We need that now so that the vehicle manufacturers and their suppliers can be prepared. Um, it's going to take a couple of years for deployments and things to get into vehicles and then for the operators to be deploying stuff, the piece has to be upgraded. But we need specifications in place for all of that stuff to proceed. Uh, and I don't I don't believe we're doing anything that's going to force free to be corner at all. Yeah, here Maya again. I, I didn't mean that uh, you force us in a corner, but I, I think it's, uh, it could give the impression that competing work is done and or that uh, work is done based on a TR uh, which not even stays in the same organization but is coming from Etsy towards 3GPP which is basically not giving any guarantee at all that any of the requirements in there will be taken over by SA1 as they are written there. Uh, I'm not saying they will not be taken over, most likely they will, most likely everything will go smoothly, but we have to be very clear here that uh, this does not, uh, that, that we don't create a solution here that then in the end doesn't work with the requirements that come out of 3GPP. I think we sh our, our main goal should be that we strive that, that things are fully aligned. Thanks. So, Keith Trage, I mean, you mention, keep mentioning deployment cycles and how long it takes to deploy equipment. But, I mean, you've already mentioned that, yes, there might be, for example, a flight center at the NAS layer from the network to the UE that says e call is supported in IMS versus e call is supported in the CS domain. But that doesn't exist yet. And it's not going to happen until someone actually defines e call at the stage one level in 3GPP. So you're going to have exactly the same deployment cycle problem with respect to that. And if people turn around and say, ah, oh, we haven't got the time to do that bit of that work, we don't think UEs are going to end up supporting it because they already do this that's in this internet draft, then we're going to end up with a network-based solution that's going to have to do interworking, which I would hate to do, but that's basically what the way these things work. Um, and that if you do interworking in the network, then you're going to provide constraints on how the service operates in IMS because it's got to work at the lowest common denominator of both sides at the interworking point. Right. I don't think that there's anything in this draft that, uh, that either precludes or, or, or not uh, how interworking will work or whether that flag, I simply mention that flag is something that people talk about uh, as being a likely thing to do. Uh, I don't think anybody's saying that they won't be done because So, so Randy, I hear you saying that we don't want to progress this draft very fast. We want to wait on... Well, I mean, I think given the amount of time it takes to get work done here, I think that we're progressing and I think that we should continue to progress because I don't want to delay. I'll also point out that this working group started doing, um, especially how to do emergency calls using SIP before 3GPP. <coughs> that worked out pretty well. There was a little Involving, uh, you know, what the construction is about, the requirement of the UE loss and so forth, which is incompatible with the GPP, but we had modifications to that document to allow the particular things to be fully compatible. Um, that's the, the normal way things work. We, we make sure everything is compatible and everything works together nicely. Okay, so what, what's your suggestion for the next step on this document? Well, I think that we should continue progressing this, this working group on this document.
Um, just as a point of historical information, the work item for 3 gpp emergency call, I believe, was around in 2000. It got deferred from release to release. Okay. But, um, <laughs> That's kind of... One way or the other. Um, but, I mean, basically, I mean, the main point is that we've actually ended up with a different way of doing emergency call in 3 gpp and, indeed, in M493 to what is specified by the IETF documents. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew Allen, well, just one thing, the stage one for release 13 is frozen in 3 gpp So the earliest that anything would come out in 3 gpp is probably at least three years away in, in terms of it, it, the, final, yeah, the final solution is, is at least three years or more away. And release 14 will be synced with 5G, so that's somewhat dependent on other things related to the 5G work in ITU as well, so the time scales for that. So, okay. uh, so you know, you're not going to get major work happening in terms of architecture in 3 gpp for at least another year on this. Okay, thank you. And, and that's the point, right? Either we say, all right, we will stop doing anything for three to five years, or we finish this. Uh, I'm not that pessimistic. <laughs> um, um, I think what would be very good would that SA1 has a look at the requirements at this TR. And um, from that, we will see how much the thinking of SA1 and basically 3GPP is in sync with what came out of SA. Do you think a and liaison would help speed that up? Sorry? Do you think a liaison from us to them? I think that would that be uh, a good idea to basically say, uh, can we have some sort of first feedback on whether these requirements are a good base to start or to progress to work here? And I, I don't want to block any work here, honestly not. I just want to make sure that we're working towards a common solution because what Keith was saying, uh, that things then in the end need to be interworked, I think that sounds even more horrible than waiting five years. So uh, let's, I don't want to wait five years. I think if, if the work that is done here is based on requirements that are okayed by SA1, then we have a very good base that we can reuse this draft later on in maybe hopefully only one year when we do the related CT1 works or the basic protocol work requirements. Thank you. Okay. So Randy, would you be willing to take an action item to submit possible liaison words to the list so sure. that we can start that discussion? Sure. Thanks. Maybe we can move forward. Yeah, Randy's going to going to start the, the liaison discussion on the mailing list with some proposed text for a liaison because he knows the, the history of the draft and what's prompted it so he can meld all that information into the, the background of the liaison. Yeah. So we're done with our, our work group items. We're now going to entertain. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. 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 I, I was thinking of the, the agenda, but. We're now going to entertain an individual draft that uh, Dr. Stanley is going to present. I just got to find it. You can actually come up here and do it officially. You don't have to stand back there. We do have a microphone. Randy didn't want it for some reason. No. You're trying to be casual. You didn't want to look at this great view, right? Look everybody in the face. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I'm Dorothy Stanley, Aruba Networks, and um, myself, Roger, and uh, Mark have put together uh, an individual submission draft. It is posted, as are these slides. So first of all, a bit of context. Um, it's an individual submission document. It has not yet been adopted by the working group, although that is the request that you'll see at the end uh, for people to read the document, uh, give us feedback, and consider uh, adopting it as a working group draft. The context is indoor location and indoor location for emergency services. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so why are we talking about indoor location? Well, 20 years ago, how many people in the U.S. ever thought that they would get rid of their landline phone? Probably not very many. Uh, but today that's happening. And the emergency call system, the E911 system that was deployed with landline phones, now more and more is transitioning where the E911 calls are coming over wireless. Uh, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. It's certainly not a surprise to the FCC, who earlier this year issued a fourth report in order addressing indoor location requirements for E911 services. The link is provided here. Uh, for the astute among you, you will notice you will find that the link is in error. The document has moved. It is not at the DB0203 location. It's at 310. So if you pick up the link, yeah, pick up that link, change the 203 to 310, you'll get the PDF of the report in order. Uh, so, yeah, we'll we'll upload the document and we'll fix the yeah we'll I'll fix the slides. Uh, okay, so next slide. So today, what are the mechanisms that are used for indoor location? on wireless systems, on cellular systems. Uh, today there are two, uh, two phases, if you will, uh, that cellular networks return. The first is tower location, and that's uh, well known. It's been deployed for quite a while. Phase two is, in addition to the tower location, you give a geolocation uh, to the best of the ability of the cellular system based on additional triangulation techniques. These are mechanisms that are in transition and in transition towards improvement. And in particular, uh, a, a term is introduced in that ret uh, report in order called dispatchable location, where the goal is not just an improved geo coordinate, but a dispatchable location or civic location that can be given to the first responders uh, an address to go to and ideally some additional information uh, as much as can be obtained, for example, um, floor level um, additional information about the location in the building. So the, the key term here is dispatchable location for indoor environments. And this is particularly important if you have an office complex, uh, a large dormitory, a, uh, a large apartment building, you know, where more is needed than just you know, 210 Park Avenue. Next slide. Uh, the next two slides give some examples of the type of granularity of information that's returned by systems today. Uh, this slide shows an example of a phase two cellular location. So this is the location ring, essentially, that's provided to the E911 service uh, with both the tower location, which in this figure is number one there, and the additional granularity based on triangulation. So in this particular area, it's about a five block area uh, with a number of multiple story buildings. So the granularity is not there. Statistics are kept by PSAP systems by and gathered by the FCC on the percentage of phase two locations that in fact are not actionable. Right where there isn't enough granularity, and that the percentage of those values is increasing. So there's uh, an interest in doing more uh, to actually get better data for these first responders and actually get a dispatchable location. Uh, next slide. Here is an example of a demonstration that was done using wireless LAN location services uh, system to provide additional information and granularity in an office building. So uh, again, a demo system using existing um, wireless LAN equipment where the information that's provided to the, uh, that can be provided to the emergency uh, system is both the map and the information as, long, as well as a dispatchable address uh, the address is here is 2250 
East President George Bush Highway. And in addition, a schematic of the building floor is provided. Typically in most commercial office buildings, the floor maps are all available. Uh, universities have the same thing for all the dormitories. And these things can be provided along with the uh, map location. So you'll see the drawing here where the uh, floor plan layout is shown and the big red dot is where the emergency call was made from. So this type of information would, would tremendously reduce the number of unactionable uh, phase two or wireless reported uh, sets of data. Next slide. So how do we get there? How do we get better indoor location for a lot of these scenarios where it's just not available today? In the industry, there are two approaches that are being discussed. The first uh, is in the category uh, in terms of beaconing. So what is beaconing? So when I think of beaconing, I think of lighthouses, right? Lighthouses sent out the lights on a periodic basis, and the ships could tell by the lighthouses that they saw and the lights that they saw where they were, right? And it's the same philosophy here, where whether it's a Bluetooth low energy beacon or a wireless LAN beacon that's heard as an RF signal, uh, hearing that beacon is not enough. You have to go to the database or your paper list of all of the lighthouses or a mapping of lighthouse to actually physical location. So you have to have a pre-provisioned beacon location database that you go and you can then figure out where you are, where these beacons are, and then where you are. The other approach, uh, other than beacons that's being discussed, is real-time network-based information. And here, uh, the approach that we're looking at being in the wireless LAN industry is wireless LAN network infrastructure location services. Often location capabilities that are present and being uh, deployed for an enterprise's purposes anyway can be leveraged to provide additional information for the E911 service. Um, today, a lot, uh, virtually all of the deployed systems use RSSI. There are additional mechanis uh, mechanisms under development in 802.11. Uh, 802.11 MC, which is the revision PAR, uh, probably that uh, document will publish in 2016, has introduced a mechanism called fine timing measurement uh, that's under development by many vendors now. And then there's a new project in 802.11 called Next Generation Positioning, which is going to look at even additional mechanisms for both 11AC systems and 11AD systems. That's the 60 gigahertz, which will be deployed in the future. And you can get really, really good granularity uh, in those systems. Next slide. Uh, the next two slides give a little more detail about the beacon mechanisms and the WLAN mechanisms. Uh, for the beaconing, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy is out there and starting to be deployed. Uh, you get proximity information, again, not location. You have to go to the database to figure out the location. Uh, wireless LAN APs, uh, similarly, but um, there's there are additional functionality, pieces of functionality that are available there. You can provide a pre-provision reference point and an access point. You can pre-provision the access point to know where it is. Um, in the wireless LAN systems, you also have management frames that can deliver uh, location information. Uh, you do require a supporting database uh, if you're using the beaconing approach. And in GeoPriv terms, what we're talking about in a beaconing approach is location by reference. Next slide. Uh, the real-time WLAN location query, and this is the one that we're really focusing on in the individual submission draft, is leveraging the abilities, the capabilities of a wireless LAN system for the benefit of E911 services. So in this scenario, the cellular carrier or the carrier's designee um, agent would ask the wireless LAN network to locate a specific device or UE based on an identifier. And the WLAN network location information server would then uh, search its uh, database for the location of that end device and return a response. 
So the WLAN system typically would locate a device based on its MAC address. And as I mentioned today, uh, earlier, there are uh, RSSI mechanisms today that are, that are used for the location, and there are additional mechanisms being developed in DOT 11. In addition, most deployed WLAN location systems are able to return a, bil a building map and that is available. And when you're talking about uh, har commercial multi-story buildings or uh, university dorms or uh, large apartment buildings, you know, that kind of information can really be extremely beneficial to the emergency responders. Next slide. So what is the ask to ECRIT? The ask to ECRIT is, number one, read the draft because that's essential. Uh, this is an individual submission. It's not yet a working group document, but we'd like to ask the group to consider adopting it, which cannot be done until you read it. And then uh, the purpose of the draft that is posted would be to document the problem, uh, some, describe some use cases, and identify high-level requirements. A second stage and a second document would be to document a protocol that would be used from the WLAN location information server or entity uh, from the uh, emergency infrastructure system uh, and a protocol there to, uh, for a query and response of the location. And here we're talking about really dispatchable location, so it would be a civic address. So that is the presentation. Uh, we've done a little bit of thinking about alternative protocols. The one that obviously comes to mind is HELD or some variation of it. Uh, but we're not, we're not there yet. We're back at the top, which is all understanding the problem space, documenting the requirements, and considering uh, adopting the draft as a working group item. Thank you. So I have to ask from a chair's position, how many people have read this draft? Okay, so obviously not everybody saw that I'd ask you to read it on the list, otherwise I'm sure you all would have. But we're obviously looking for comments um, to, to, to move it forward and possibly accept it as a work group item. Go ahead, Keith. So Keith Drage here, I mean, one concern I would have is that if we're not careful, we end up with multiple players i.e. multiple SDOs, all trying to play in the same space. Now, I believe your final slide here is focusing on one specific area that says this is IETF space. But I don't think the draft that you've actually got, that we've, you've provided, does that, or does not seem to. It just describes there is a general problem. Um, maybe what the draft needs is basically a conclusion that says, this is what we can do in this area. This is what other SDOs in this are doing in this area. So that it actually leads to the conclusion that you specify a protocol for query and response. So I don't think that's in the draft at the moment, is it? Tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, we, I don't think these last two bullets are in the draft. No, the, conclu yeah. the conclusion yeah. of uh, developing a profile of held to serve as the protocol here is not in the draft currently. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, add another section at the end that basically says, other SDOs are doing this. This space still exists. IETF should do this. OK, thank you. Thank you. Andrew, yes, I, that's similar to Keith. I just ask, obviously, I, IEEE is, is responsible for 802.11. Is there any overlap with what they're doing there? Because we don't want to have multiple work groups working on the same kind of things. So this needs to be coordinated is my point. And right. I, I think the good news is here we have a pretty good spokesman from that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I have, I, 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 I don't attend IEEE, but I have heard from some of my colleagues some work like this going on elsewhere, so. Okay. Right. So the work going on in DOT 11 is the MAC layer work defining the frames that go over the air between the client device and the access point to either exchange the location data itself or enable location to be determined. Um, definition of a protocol between an infrastructure component 
to an emergency call system is not being done in dot 11. Uh, Brian Rosen. So um, I read the draft. Um, I'm supportive of this work. I think it's a really cool idea. I, I'm um, a, a little concerned about um, the horse race the character people trying to characterize the beacon idea with this this idea as being an either or circumstance. Um, and I don't think it is. Um, I think it, uh, it, 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 it's, it could be both. I mean, you could do, you, these things could be part of, it could be a, a much more integrated system. The, the thing that I keep, I, I like this, and I, there's so many environments in which it's just a great, great, great idea. I mean, a college campus is like one of the very best ones, but it doesn't work everywhere. And the problem we have with emergency services is it has to work everywhere. And so solutions like this, must, where they, I, I, I really, I would really like to make sure that we can, we solve everything, um, and and that in specific relative to that that great comment a little while ago. What is the right thing for the ITF to do here? Because there are many players in the Beacon idea, um, and there are many players in, in in terms of organizations, I mean people or companies, I meant organizations. And what is the right thing, what is the right part for the ITF to do? I mean, it's likely protocol work and things like that. But um, um, I, I would like to see us look beyond this one little piece. Okay, I'd like to address your comment about uh, you'd like to solve uh, solve the problem and have it work all the time, right? Have emergency calls that work all the time. Well, there's no one mechanism that is going to give you dispatchable location all the time, right? Cellular outdoor gives you good geo. Cellular indoor gives you reasonable geo mu some of the time, right? Bluetooth low energy, low energy where it's deployed and a beacon mechanism is going to work in some places where you're able to build the database and of beacon, beacon devices and their locations and people deploy those devices and actually tell you where they are and keep that updated. That's not going to happen everywhere, right? And so there, there are components of the geography that need to be covered by these di different mechanisms. And in the WLAN case, I think there's a, um, a large number of environments where this can really work well where the others don't. Uh, Bernard about Microsoft, just a comment. I think what you're trying to accomplish here is to build a component of a potential architecture. And if it's done well, it could work with a number of different schemes. Uh, but uh, as far as evaluating the accuracy, it, you really have to, it has to be part of a system. Like you could have a protocol that could work with the, the beacon or the RSSI stuff or a variety of things. But you wouldn't know what the accuracy is until you designed a specific system and, and looked at it. And I think that's kind of that part of it is outside the scope of the ITF, but providing yeah. the tools with which you could build stuff is kind of naturally, I think, uh, something we could do, particularly since we have expertise withheld and, you know, been doing this for a while. Yeah, uh, I agree. And, and uh, Brian Rosen, so I, I, I mean, I do, I understand what you're saying and I agree with it. Um, no one thing is going to work everywhere, period, the end. That's the reality. Um, I, I, I do think that, um, if we choose to do just this piece in isolation, we will lose um, something that we would gain by looking at things a little bit more broad broadly. Um, maybe this document only covers this one case, but if the work group looks at it in a little bit wider scope, we might find some commonality of data structures, protocol mechanisms, whatever, that we can, we can do things right once and then reuse it in multiple environments. I mean, we're thinking about using help. I mean, as a, just as an example, but I, I, I just, I don't want to be too narrow at this stage. That's fair. Thank you. Uh, Bernardo, but just, just to comment, it might help to have, uh, understand who the partners for this work would be. I mean, we're kind of delivering the protocol piece. Presumably someone goes out then and integrates it and has a bunch of test results that tell us how work, how well it works. I'm just not sure who those partners would be, but it would, it might be helpful because then they could come back and say, hey, there's this other thing we need. Um, it'll give you some external validation, uh, which might be useful. Thank you, Bernard.
so it's key three. So I'll just point out that 3TPP does have an open work item on supporting um, emergency call over wireless LAN when that wireless LAN forms part of either a trusted or an untrusted network in a 3GPP system. So, Keith, is any part of that work include device location? Um, it's, I mean, it's basically a study item at the moment, so um, it could do. I think it's actually, it's, it's been to a certain extent phased, so I think the device location part is actually a later item at the moment. Okay, I, well, I guess that could always change anyway. Right. I, I guess I would be curious to look at that to see if 3GPP actually understands the mechanisms that's been described here, <laughs> right? That, that 802.11 networks inherently have the capability to locate devices. Okay. Andrew Allen, yeah, so on this point. Now, my understanding of this, the idea here is that this mechanism would work regardless of whether you, you're using wireless LAN to actually access and place an emergency call, right? It would work on other systems, but you would use the beacon signals in order to determine, so even if you weren't using the wireless LAN to, to make the call. Right. Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Roger? No. So that concludes ECRIT at IETF 92. I guess we'll see people in Prague. I'm sorry? As of now, <laughs> things change. So thank you. See you next time. I'll let you out 17 minutes early. Use it wisely. <laughs> So, do you have a few minutes to be brief? being run out already.
Now he's chewing his hot not put that solution in. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He's lazy, dude. How's Joe? Uh, this Joe's fine. That's it. Just Wow. What's there, adult beverages in your afternoon or what? Yeah, I'm quite surprised. I guess. What's, what happened to his no sip mafia dinner this time? Uh, there's some talk of doing a cruise in that hall. Email just came out. Ah. I'm just bitching because I'm leaving tomorrow morning anyway. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm going up here.